so thankful this morning that we can sing that out with confidence knowing that you will never move that you will never change that you will never fail us God Lord you're fighting for us you've already won the battle you hold the victory Jesus you reign in glory God I pray that you would encourage anyone here who needs to see you move. God, would you move for them? God, I pray that you would strengthen our faith in you. Lord, we've seen you move before and we know that you are still a God of miracles, that you are still making a way. Thank you for how faithful and good and true you are to us, God. You're the only sure thing in this life. So Lord, I pray that we would put our hope in you. We would put our trust in you. We would put our life in you, Jesus, because everything else, everything else will fade, but you remain. And Lord, let our response be worship. Let our response be praise for how good and faithful you are, for how perfect you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are here with us. God, we surrender to you. We turn our eyes to you. And we worship you because we love you. It's in your holy name I pray. Amen.
stay in this place. It says in God's word that we who have had that veil removed, we contemplate the Lord's glory. And that's what we want to do during these times. Our, our songs and these, this music is meant to be a vehicle to get us into that place. So we want to contemplate him. And, and that glory, that glory that we contemplate with him, he begins to give that to us. And when he gives that to us, we move from one place of glory to another. And we become more and more like him. So we don't, we don't effort and strive to become like him. We come and we, we give him honor. We give him worship. And in that, we're, we're transformed into that place. Part of that ongoing trans, transformation is when we give of ourselves, that's when he starts to change us. One of the things that you've done as you've given of yourselves to this greater Portland area is you've, you've helped people. And we, we do that through this Go Team initiative that we have here. And as you continue to give, people, it says in God's word, let you, you let your light shine and people then glorify our Father in heaven. One of the, the philosophies, overarching philosophies, as we try to make decisions on, on dispersing what you've given is that it moved people toward a betterment situation, that their trajectory can, can keep moving forward so that God can be glorified by that. And just reviewing the, the many, many, many ways that you've helped people just recently, there was a, a young mother, and um, she was in an abusive situation, and in another organization she was working with helped her get out of that. She escaped that. Then her abuser found her again, broke into her place, stole all of her money. She couldn't pay her rent. She got behind on that. So we collaborated with that other organization. We were able to pay her rent so she can continue to move toward schooling and, and eventually getting into that career that she wanted. And people see that, the organizations, the individuals, even the little children, they give glory to our Father in heaven for what you've done through that. And we just thank Jesus for that. There's so many ways that we're able to give here at East Point, but first and foremost, the way to give is to give yourselves to God. And just give over to him every day that he can delight in you, that you make God's day in that. Then, then you can go on the giving app or you can give online, or you can give with the giving boxes in the back. But that's what gives him so much glory. So let me pray for us. Father, I, uh, I thank you for the furtherance of your kingdom that we take with all of this that you give us and we, we redirect it back out again. And there's, uh, there's never an end to that. You have all the resources. So, Father, help us to be faithful with that. Let it go out in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you get a chance to meet your neighbor and make their day better.
Good morning, good morning. Church family, how are we this morning? Great to see you. That was underwhelming. <laughs> hey, big question this morning. Who was at that Need to Breathe concert last night? All right. Now, all of you who took videos of me dancing with my daughter, you must delete them. Do not put them on social media. I got more videos sent my way, and it wasn't me. It was my daughter. She was stealing the show as she was dancing up at Freeport. And, uh, man, it's just so much fun. If I can be honest, to be able to show up at a place where the communities gather together in southern Maine, and there's just a bunch of you all hanging out, and it's just like the, the light of Jesus walking around the grounds at L.L. Bean and Freeport. It's these moments that we've been talking about this summer that we live as sent followers of Jesus. Right? We can have fun while we're being sent. We can, we can enjoy. We can be with other people. But we must never miss the opportunity to say, I'm a missionary. God, what would you do in this moment? Seeing all sorts of people, this church family, I'm just excited to be a part of what God's doing here in this place as we worship, as we give God glory, as, as Kurt talked about. And you know what he'll do in return? He'll use us to build his church here in Maine. He'll use us to bring the hope of the world because this world needs some hope this morning, doesn't it? This world needs some hope. And I'll tell you what, hope is not found in a person or an office. Hope is found in Christ alone. And if you're here for hope this morning, I promise you that's the hope we're going to give you. That the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is alive. That Christ is risen and He is meeting people and changing their lives. The stuff that we're facing in our culture is nothing new. It's existed since the beginning. It's existed since the church was born. And yet the church must remain faithful to Jesus and Jesus alone. And so I'm excited to continue in this series this summer as we're talking about being sent followers of Jesus. And today we're talking about the marketplace, the, the place where we work, the place that we study, and the place that we play. And uh, so we're going to jump right into the book of Acts this morning. And before we do, I want to welcome those tuning in online. We're glad to have you, our friends and family at Cumberland County Jail. Uh, we are just cheering you on. Love what God's doing over there. And any guests in the house, uh, we are just in this series where we're talking about what it means to be followers of Jesus, living missional lives. Because God loves people and he wants his people, his children, drawn back to himself in this deep relationship that we've found here as a church family. And so I want to bring us back all the way to the beginning of the series where we talked about really two things. That our responsibility is one, to be witnesses. And the second is to make disciples. Right, that we're to be witnesses of simply what God's doing in our lives. That it isn't a matter of having these, these strong legal arguments, but it's simply just saying, let me tell you about what Jesus has done and is doing in me. And secondly, it's to make disciples. Those who have this holy curiosity that, that want to learn more. We see it all through the book of Acts. As Paul and his companions go around, they're sharing about what God has done in their lives. They're simply being witnesses. And yet, there's always a small portion or large portion of people who say, tell me more. That's where discipleship begins. It begins when we start unpacking the truths of God. And so for us as sent followers of Jesus, our responsibility is to make disciples as we are being witnesses. And if you ask me, as somebody who spent really the, the first five or six years of my life out of, the co out of college, I was in the marketplace. And right here in the state of Maine, right here in New England and in the Northeast, and if you ask me where the number one mission field that is unreached right now in America, it's the marketplace. It's the place where we work. It's the, it's the place that we study. It's, it's the people around us. Most of us, if we're working full time, we're working 40 plus hours a week. If we're, if we're studying, we're studying. Well, you should be studying, children, 40 plus hours a week. I can't say I always did that in school. And also where we play, where we recreate the, the places we go to play pickleball or, or we go to play bingo or, or whatever we do for recreation. These are all areas that unfortunately for, for centuries the church has compartmentalized all of their spiritual focus into a Sunday morning experience. We're going to break that down. We're going to keep breaking that down because there are people that God loves in the marketplace that he might be sending you, that you have a unique ability to reach them. That if you look around this, this entire auditorium, there's people, for every single seat in this room, there's people 
that God can only reach through you because of your unique influence. I will never have the opportunity to talk to them. People around you might never have the opportunity to talk to them. Think about the 10 unique people you have and multiply that by a few hundred people in here. What an incredible opportunity for influence. And so this is, this is what we're focusing on is, is the marketplace. But unfortunately, we, we get kind of stuck in this balancing act of the work-life balance, right? We're going to talk a little bit about God's view of work today and also the space in which we work. And so many of us have that, that focus of we need to the right appropriate work-life balance, right? We, we work to live. We don't live to work. Now, I'm watching a couple spouses nudge their significant other, right? Did you hear him? Ashley used to always nudge me. She's like, Keenan, we work to live, not live to work. So you can stop at 75 hours a week. <laughs> you can close the laptop on Sunday. You can, but there's this drive in us that we want to do good. We want to put we want to put things in place to add value in people's lives. We want to be good workers, employees, students friends, teammates, right? We want to we wanna do well. And so as I started understanding the, the commands of Jesus and the life that he invited me into, I started seeing that, that there was this stark divide, in my opinion, between work, well, that's, that's Sodom and Gomorrah, Monday through Friday, and then there's my following Jesus. Well, that's, that's glory here on Sunday mornings. I was wrong. You see, I started having this, this, this despair seep into me. I got the Sunday evening blues. Anybody ever get those? I was like, oh, man, I got to go back to this. As the sun started setting, I started dreading Monday morning. Now, for me, work started early. Work, work was, was a 3, 30, 4 o'clock wake-up call with a long commute, and I was dreading, dreading having to get in my pickup and head to work for the week. And I, I related to, to Genesis when, when God speaks to Adam because of the sin in the garden. This is, what, this is what God says to Adam in Genesis 3. And this felt, I felt like this was my reality. To Adam, or Kenan, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. I was like, yep, that's my reality. Right, that it just feels like this grind, that, that nothing I do brings purpose. The work that I'm trying to, to put in place or trying to help with, it just, it seemed, it seemed just, it was dissolving through my fingertips. It felt like vanity. And it put me in a really hard heart position. I was discontent. I was frustrated. I was burdened. I began resenting the place that I worked and even the people that I worked with because I felt like I was cursed because I had to work. But then something changed as I began reading my Bible. And how often does that help us change our minds when we read God's Word? When we get in God's Word and it begins reorienting our mindset. All of the toil and the frustrations and the stresses, they started going away. And, and it really made a, a huge impact when I read this quote in the Bible I had at the time. That Pastor Robert McCracken, this is what he said, and, and it, was, it was posted on a page in my Bible. A man or a woman can be as truly a saint in a factory as in a monastery. And there is much need of him in the one as in the other. I think there's people in this room that need that encouragement this morning. Can we put that, that, ver that um, quote back up there? That somebody can be as truly a saint in a factory as in a monastery. And there's much need of him in the one as in the other. You see, God's, God's plan is a redemptive plan all through this region. And it's also Monday through Saturday. That wherever we work, think about the places that we work or, or that we study or the places that we recreate. Those are spaces that God wants to meet people through. It doesn't just happen in the church and in the monastery. It doesn't just happen in our neighborhoods. It might happen in our workplace. You see, my question this morning, as we're framing this conversation, my question comes down to this simple analogy, and I'm going to ask it up front, and then I'll unpack it. Are you a thermostat 
in those spaces of influence, or are you a thermometer? Now, I know engineering brain, Keenan gets really caught up in these little things, right? But imagine what a thermostat does, right? If you have a thermostat on your wall at home, you set the temperature of the room. A thermometer simply reads the temperature of the room and responds accordingly, right? And so are we spiritual thermostats when we step into the room and the spaces that we work and we have influence? Are we setting the spiritual temperature? Are we setting the, the, the temperature of the room relationally? Or are we just simply a thermometer and we rise and fall as the temperature is set by somebody else, right? As I started seeing my world, my, my life as I would step into the marketplace and to work specifically, for me it was a job site trailer, I had to start realizing I was a thermostat and not a thermometer. See, before I would rise and fall on, on maybe the, 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 the tenor of the room or the conversations, and those conversations weren't always clean, especially when you wear a hard hat. Right? I'd get caught up in some of those conversations and I'd, I'd feel like, man, God, why am, I, why am I getting so drawn into some of this? Which, quite frankly, much of it was sin. But yet God was inviting me to live in to this life of being a spiritual thermostat. I would disengage from those conversations. I would create safe spaces to have other conversations. I would actually out the Christians on our job site. And some of them actually sit in this room on Sundays. And there was moments where I was able to actually bring the presence of God because of my relationship with him into the workplace. It's all about his abiding presence in us. And so that's my question this morning. Are you a thermostat? Are you simply a thermometer wherever we find ourselves tomorrow morning? You see, Tim Keller in his book, Every Good Endeavor, says our daily work can be a calling only if it is reconceived as God's assignment to serve others. Right? Our our daily work can be a calling only if it is reconceived as God's assignment to serve others. So the big idea today, and it kind of, I've, I've alluded to it, is that the marketplace is a mission field. The marketplace is a mission field. And I get that many of our employers, they, they really aren't fans of us talking about Jesus on the clock, are they? There's employees that, quite frankly, they could, they could put a, a, they could submit a report based on our conversations we have with them if we get a little too overboard. But I guarantee you, there is no policy in your workplace that prevents you from loving other people as Jesus loved them. There's no policy that says you can't love somebody with compassion and humility and generosity and encouragement. The greatest sermon we'll ever preach is the sermon that we live. And it's the way that we love people and it's the way that we engage people and it's the way we come around them that leads to these conversations that at first could be very relational and they might turn spiritual. But when someone's drawing in and asking you questions, all we have to do is be witnesses. The marketplace around us is an incredible mission field. But how do we see it? How do we see our occupation? Do we see it as an occupation or do we see it as a vocation? Right, when we look at the marketplace, is it simply just a place that occupies our time where we're putting out a deliverable or, or we're producing a result or we're scanning the groceries as they come across the, the scanner or are we, are we drafting as an engineer the, the design or do we see ourselves living out our vocation as followers of Jesus in whatever sphere he puts us? That we're prayerful, we're relational, we're having conversations even while we're putting work in place. So I'm going to bring us to Acts chapter 18 because we're going to see a model and an example from Paul himself as he's planting churches. Now this is not prescriptive, right? We don't take the recipe from this passage and say, well, this is what I must do. But it's descriptive in showing us the heart of an apostle as he engages church planting work. Because many people believe a pastor or a priest or a minister is this full-time person that sometimes wears a clerical collar, holds a Bible, and never sins. (laughs) wrong. Right? But too often we have this this misordered view of what church leadership should look like. I'll tell you, church leadership should look like the greatest servants that you find in your lives. The first people willing to put in the the long, hard day of work, that, that lead ahead, that help other people come to know Jesus. And Paul himself did not want to burden the local church, this small little fledgling church, with helping him put food on the table. So he did that himself. And so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 18. 
where we see Paul, he's now heading from, from Macedonia, from this modern day area of Turkey, heading in to Greece. And in uh, chapter 18, verse 1, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And so this is, Paul's showing up, he's sharing the gospel, he's encouraging people, he finds Priscilla and Aquila, and he ends up hanging out with them. They find camaraderie, and they start making tents. Now, if you find any pastors that are making tents, they're significantly more spiritual. Most pastors find themselves as carpenters because that's what Jesus did, right? And so there's something about this, this laboring with their hands, creating something that gives them an opportunity not to build a great product, but to have conversation with people, right? And Paul's earning a wage so that he can live throughout the week. But what does he do on Sabbath, on Saturday? He goes to the synagogues. He proclaims the truth. He shares the hope of the gospel. Now for me, this was incredibly encouraging when I wasn't in full-time ministry because for me, I was sitting there saying, well, I've just got to subcontract all the ministry stuff to the paid professionals because I'll probably screw it up. Well, even when you're a paid professional, you screw it up, trust me. But I gave me, this gave me permission to say, hey, there's opportunities in my spheres of influence to share the gospel because if Paul was simply making tents and taking it upon himself to share the hope of Jesus that he's found within him, Man, maybe I can too. But what I want to share is we can't do this alone. A few weeks ago we talked about it's just better together, right? And so today I want to reemphasize that, that we need to find in our spheres of influence the other missionaries. Right? We need to find the other people in our spheres of influence who also know Jesus, who are following Jesus, because we can do this together. Kurt and I have talked about this many different times. Kurt used to, to lead uh, as, a, as a production manager over at a film development company, and he, he led it all during the night shift. Now, if you want to know, anybody that's ever worked night shift, that's where stuff really happens. Right? And so Kurt, the first thing he would do is he would out all the Christians. So if you showed up while Kurt's leading and he found out that you're a Christian, you're going to get found out. You're going to get, he's going to talk to you about Jesus. He's going, to, he's going to mingle with you. There's this encouragement that when everybody finds out that they're followers of Jesus, well, they can start seeing their workplace as a mission field. Now, this is not a corporate takeover plan. I want you to know that. But God might have called many people to one area to reach a few. God might be calling you into a place that you never anticipated to reach somebody with the gospel. There's people that I've been a part of their journey to Jesus, and it began with a coworker sharing the gospel with them in the break room. It was somebody who said, hey, can I pray for you at a job site? It was somebody that their life was so broken, they didn't care where they were, they just needed hope, and it was a coworker, a peer. It could have been a subordinate that shared the hope of the gospel, and they found themselves walking with Jesus. They found themselves adding value within the church. There's so much opportunity in the marketplace, but we need to find the other missionaries. See, so we're going to skip back to earlier in the book of Acts because it kind of builds up this idea that, that Paul is working in and through the church to be able to move this mission forward, and he's not simply just sitting back on his haunches disengaging from the marketplace. In Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 1, this is, this is before that they come to Corinth, Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollon, uh, Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So Paul goes to the synagogue, three Sabbath days, shares the hope of the gospel that Jesus himself is the Messiah, that he's risen from the dead, he's fulfilled the scriptures, that he's coming to meet those people, you and I, today. And we go, well, there, there's Paul doing his pastoral duties. The rest of the week, Paul was working. 
Paul was laboring. Paul was earning his keep and discipling other people and engaged in the work that they were as well. You see, he was in Thessalonica where he was planting this church. And, and in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes to the church. He says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. God's got this beautiful, redemptive plan of work that we're able to add value in people's lives. We're able to, to, to do it in relationship with other people. We're able to earn our keep. Work adds dignity. It's not a curse from the Garden of Eden. Now, if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, would you and I have to punch in and punch out every week? I think not. So we can thank Adam and Eve for that original sin that we would have committed ourselves, but we can't just hang simply on the cursedness of the hard ground and the, the thorns and the sweat of our brow. We need to look at our work as an opportunity for God to play out his story in people's lives. Now it makes us uncomfortable, right? Because we're like, well, that's your job, preacher. That's the life group leader's job. That's the, that's the youth leader's job. That's the, the outreach team's job. Think about the influence we all carry just in the places that we engage the marketplace. And Jesus calls each and every one of us out to be a part of his church. And the church is not a building. The church is not an auditorium. The church isn't even a weekly gathering. It's called out once. It's the people who, like Peter, say, you, Jesus, are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're right, Peter. And it's upon that statement that I'm going to build my church. So any of us that call upon Jesus' name, that believe that he is the Messiah, he's building us up and he's sending us out. Sent followers of Jesus living on mission. And work, work is good. Work is important. Work demonstrates God's character. In 2 Thessalonians Chapter 3, Paul goes on to write in his second letter to this church. He says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teachings you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. How we work demonstrates God's character. Remember, we're not going to hang out on the Whoever's not willing to work shall not eat because, because that's a big broad brush stroke statement and it's contextualized here. But for many of us, we, we look at our work as something that we just, it's secondary. And what, what Paul is saying, no, this is after our model. Just imitate us as you, you put your hand to the plow and, and you're able to be generous. You're able to, to give with compassion to other people. John Wesley says, earn all you can to save all you can so that you get, can give all you can. Right, bringing dignity and redemption back to work and in the marketplace. That what we do starting tomorrow morning and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, whatever we choose to engage in, if it's work, God is going to use that. And it's mostly the people that are around you working with you. It's the people that you're influencing. It's the model that you're living. But don't fail to understand how we work demonstrates God's character. As I was reading through this, I was thinking about that, that point that Paul says, we did this not because you do, we, we do not have the right to such help. He says, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. There was this guy that I worked with. His name was John Gamage. John is probably one of the most humble, anonymous human beings that lives in the 207 area code. I don't even know what town he lives in, but it's around the great metrop metropolis of Solon, Maine. Anybody know where Solon is? The only thing there is a tomato plant growing facility. Funny story on that, actually. I'm just going to share this. So I have a friend of mine 
This is, has nothing to do with the sermons, but I'm still going to share it. So a friend of mine, his name's Ryan, and he was super excited to see the northern lights that were coming into town. And many of us have seen the northern lights over the summer. And so somebody said, you can go to this high hill up near Skowhegan, and you can look out over the western mountains, and you'll see the northern lights. Well, Ryan had this sweet young girl as a new girlfriend, and he wanted to show her the northern lights. And so they jumped in the car. They drove to this hilltop. They're looking over kind of in Madison and Solon, Maine, and they're looking out over the mountains, and they see this glowing happening. And they go, man, those must be the northern lights. And it's this white washed light. And he's like, well, this is really underwhelming. They stared at it for an hour and a half. And they came back. They said the northern lights were super underwhelming. And we said, what do you mean? They actually didn't come out last night. They go, well, what was that light? Well, we geographied the whole. They were looking at the light immersion from the tomato plant. <laughs> for an hour and a half. So if you ever want to go to Solon and see anything, go see the northern lights. I assure you, they're glowing every single night in Solon. So this is where John Gamage was from. And the tomato plants are way more famous than he is. But John is famous in my life. John is probably famous only in my life. And I'll tell you, he's also famous in his wife's and his daughter's life. That John, he doesn't care about fame anywhere else. He cares about being famous in his own home. But for me... John made an indelible mark on my life. And so when it comes to, to leading this, this demonstrating God's character, how we work, John was an electrical general foreman on a job site in, in Skowhegan, and John worked diligently day in and day out. John was never late. John put his crew to work. His crew did more work every single day than, than we had expected. John was this, this guy that he almost walked on water. If there's anybody that I've never seen him make a mistake, it was John. Diligent. He, he, he just radiated the character of God. And, and during lunchtime when we would all be in the lunch break room and, and swapping weekend stories that were not clean and were not God honoring, John was in his office and I knew what he was doing. He was reading his Bible. That John was, was allowing his mind to get clear for the afternoon and he was engaged in the word and he was listening to worship music and he was just a really just simple, humble man. But John also was listening. He was listening to these young guys talk about their weekend expeditions and their conquering that looked more like bars and bedrooms. And there was one day that we were setting up for, for a big project and it was in a boiler house in Skowhegan and it's dusty, it's musty, it's the last place you'd expect to experience the person and presence of God. And we were talking through this job we had to set up. It was just he and I. And he said, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, of course. What, John? And I thought it had to do with the project because I was... I was the new superintendent, and he was just a general foreman, and I wanted to be able to offer him the best insight I could as this highly experienced six months out of college kid. And so I said, of course, John, anything. You can talk to me about anything. Let me help you. He said, hey, are you saved? Like Jesus saved? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, well, yeah. You know, I grew up in church. I know that I have a Bible. Of course I am. He goes, and why don't you act like it? He said, you know, people are watching. People are listening. I was a thermometer. I wasn't a thermostat. John was a thermostat. And he was going to set the temperature of the room. That comment was so pivotal in my life. It's fried in my brain. I could take you to the fourth floor of that boiler house and show you exactly where we were standing. And it set me on a new trajectory to live with conviction for Jesus. Because I wasn't saved. I just thought I was. I hadn't bent my knee to the lordship of Jesus. I hadn't accepted his full grace and mercy. I was still living high and prideful. And yet it was John demonstrating God's character all throughout the day, all throughout the weeks, all throughout the months that I was able to look at this guy's face and knew this man stood with conviction and he actually loved me in that conversation. And so maybe that's convicting for you today because we live maybe duplicitous lives and work. At least I did. Right? I could, do, I could put my hands up here on Sunday and I could worship Jesus and I could, I could give him glory. But Monday, man, I wasn't doing that with my life, nor my words, nor my actions. And what John did is he loved me so much. He helped me reconcile those so that I was the same person throughout the week. John Gamage. He demonstrated God's character in the marketplace in a way that didn't violate policies, didn't violate human resources departments. It just violated me in a way that got me closer to Jesus. And maybe God's calling you 
to be that kind of person for somebody in your workplace. Or maybe, just maybe God might send somebody into your life like he sent John into mine. You see, Tim Keller writes again in Every Good Endeavor, an incredible book on connecting your work to God's plan. He says, a job is a vocation only if somebody else calls you to do it for them rather than for yourself. And so our work can be a calling only if it is reimagined as a mission of service or to something beyond merely our own interests. Thinking of work mainly as a means of self-fulfillment and self-realization slowly crushes a person. When we have a selfish view of our work, when we're not living for others, as John was living for the others around him, if we're simply just saying, how does this fill my my bank account? How does this help me climb the ladder? How does this help me buy the new vehicle, the new home, reach for the, the deeper retirement fund? If it's simply for us, it will slowly crush us. Because we're not meant for those pursuits. We're meant for relationship with God and for others. How do we see the marketplace as an opportunity to live that out. I'm going to go back to 1 Thessalonians where Paul looks at this church through this letter. He says, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business. Work with your hands, just as we told you, so that, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is who John was for me. He led a quiet life. He made it his ambition to work with his hands. He was diligent in all he did, and he won the respect of me, that's for sure, and everybody that worked with him. But he wasn't living for our applause. He was living for the applause of nail-scarred hands. And that's what made him so effective. John lived into this 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 vision that he would live his daily life to win the respect of outsiders so that he will not be dependent on anybody. I want to come back to to Paul making tents because this is going to help us frame really why Paul was there. I want to start with this statement, and I want you to see it played out in this this chapter of Acts as we close here, that in the marketplace, number one thing for us to recognize is that Jesus loves the people around us. And you might say, not my marketplace. (laughs) No, yes, your marketplace. The people around us are image bearers of God, have inherent dignity, and God might be rewriting their story, and you don't even know it. And God might want to use you in that redemptive story like he used John in mine. So Paul, Acts chapter 18. I'm going to recap where we first started. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Paul's working the tents and he's, he's showing up on Sabbath and he's, he's reasoning with the beauty of the gospel, this good news that Jesus has come for us. And when Silas and Timothy, they, they show up, they came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself at this moment exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. It was Silas and Timothy that undergirded Paul's efforts to free him up to be able to teach and to preach. And many believe that it was Silas and Timothy that then showed up and put their hands to the plow to make somebody like Paul available all week long to share the good news of the gospel. But when they, when they opposed, the, the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Paul shakes off the synagogue culture. He shakes off the the Sabbath religious observing Jews. And Paul heads to the people that we believe are too far from God. Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. 
do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, Paul, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. My encouragement for us is God puts you in places to remind you that there are many people in this city. There's many people in this region. As we're thinking about sent followers of Jesus living on mission here in greater Portland, there's many people in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. There are people all throughout greater Portland that God has set apart for himself, the people that God loves, drawing to himself. And God might use us like he used Paul, you like he used Paul, to go after these people, to, to hold fast to what God's doing in our hearts, even when it's, it's a bit scary and fearsome and what could be the consequences Paul got kicked out of the synagogue. And it's when he went to a Gentile worshiper of God, the facilitator of the synagogue was baptized. It's when the gospel leaves the structures of our religion. It's when, it's when we move beyond the boundaries that typical religion would circle. It's when we move across that, that even people within the church, they take notice. They say, wait, you're living not for something any longer. You're living for someone. And maybe in a culture and a time right now in society where we want to just shrink back and plug our ears and hope all this noise goes away in our culture. All the brokenness we're experiencing individually and corporately. When we want to shrink back and, and maybe draw in and, and have our holy huddle because that's where fear draws us. My challenge for us, my encouragement is it sent followers of Jesus in the face of of persecution, in the face of challenge, in the face of things that are monumental in our minds, that God does the work. We've got to step into places that require God's power because he shows up. So Paul went to the Gentile justice, this worshiper of God, that the temple facilitator, his whole household was baptized. Man, who's taking note of your life? Who's taking note of your life as you live on mission in the marketplace and in the area around you? That because of your faithfulness, because of Paul's faithfulness, because of the church's faithfulness, they're taking notice. And all you have to do is have a conversation. It's the love of Christ that compels us. Because God has so many people that he loves in this region that haven't heard his name. And he's gonna ask his church, his called out ones, to be sent into these mission fields. This is what God's inviting us to do as a church in this season. And we're seeing fruit bearing. The weeks ahead, we're gonna bring some people up to, to talk about what this looks like. We're gonna see some real life examples from some people who are living on mission for Jesus. And it's gonna get functional and pragmatic and it's gonna be tied to their story. And we're all gonna see, man, God could call me. But my question is, are you willing to say yes? You see, there's a moment that I want to frame communion in where Jesus is feeding thousands of people, right? He's, he's got fish and loaves and he's doing this incredible miracle and he's feeding the crowd and the crowd is loving it. The crowd wants more. They want more miracles. They want more bread. They want more fish. They're clamoring after Jesus, following him around the sea. And yet Jesus is so singularly focused on what's most important. Not the miracles, not the provision, all of the things that when we have this myopic view, this selfish view of the things that we need from God or we need from our workplace, we, we get pulled into this place where we're no longer living for other people. We're no longer living for God and living for those around us. And it's when Jesus confronts the crowd and he looks at them and almost mic drops on them. He says, whoever's willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood is worthy of me. Mind you, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. They were trying to wrestle with, they said, even this is a hard teaching, Jesus. What do you mean by this? We can understand some of the other stuff, but eat your flesh and drink your blood. And they slowly started disappearing. 15,000 people slowly started disappearing. But you know what was revealed in that moment? His followers. And there was 12 left. 
And he looked at them. He said, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter said, Lord, where else would we go? You're the one who has the very words of life. That's why we take communion. That we could run out of here, rah, rah, in Jesus' name. But if we're not going to behold the abiding presence of Jesus, that we want Jesus for Jesus' sake. We want Jesus and Him alone. We don't need the healing. We want the healer. We don't need the miracle. We want the miracle worker. We don't need the provision. We want the provider. We want Him. This is why we gather. His love compels us to live on mission in our marketplaces. But when you take communion with me this morning, do you believe in your heart that it's in Him in Him alone that we find the very words of life. That's why we take and we eat this morning. That's why we take and we drink. It's because Jesus has done the work for us. When we were still sinners, He came and rescued us. We were people He chased after. He paid the price on the cross. He shed the blood for our forgiveness. He invites us into eternal abundant life. And so our response simply this morning is to say, Jesus, you are the very one who has the words of life, and we will follow you. We will be your church. And so this morning, if you believe that, would you take the bread with me as we celebrate that final supper with Jesus? In this cup, the cup of the covenant, the new covenant, his love poured out over us to forgive us of our sin. Even those that might make a mockery of this moment. Even those that might drink judgment on themselves. Even those that don't hold Jesus high. This cup still can cleanse them. This cup still can cleanse us. We are not unforgivable. As long as we come under the lordship of Jesus. Giving our entire lives over him. So if you would with me, join me in taking the cup drinking his forgiveness together. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we come to you. We come to you because of the work that Jesus did for us, that he redeemed the vision of work through what he did as a carpenter and he did as a rabbi and he did through the, the work on the cross. The death he died so that we might live a life it's abundant, full of hope, full of joy, full of, of your presence, Lord. And would you give us a vision for our workplaces and the places we study and the places that we recreate, all these areas that we show up in, Father, would you give us a vision of people, the people you'd have us connect with, the people you'd have us be witnesses to, the people that you love, that you're calling to yourself, Lord, would you just give us a vision so that we might engage them with your hope? the hope that's within us, the hope that, Jesus, you are the one who has the very words of life. Lord, we honor you. Receive our worship this morning. Receive our praise as we worship you as our King. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please stand as you're able as we close in worship.
My life before I met Jesus was really sad, full of anger, because I was blaming him for things that I couldn't control. And I felt like he took my dad away because I grew up without my father. I grew up in a family that believes in God and my mom used to take us to church. I kind of believed in him, but I didn't have faith in him at all. And I started going to church, but I couldn't feel nothing. I was just like, I'm just going to church because of my family. One day, I encountered God when I asked him a question. I said, God, if you're real and if you're with me, then I want to see my father again. And that's when he proved himself. And I got to see him again after 14 years of my life. And I feel like that's when I believed that God is real and God is always with me. And that's when I started growing my faith in him and praying more. He made me wanna know him more and love him more. My life changed a lot. I used to get angry at everything and even the things to not be angry about, I would just get mad and throw a tantrum and just act crazy. But ever since that day, I am at peace. This is a way to prove to God that I'm actually committed and I really want to do it. I want to give my life to him. I want him to just take over and sh lead me and show me the way, walk with me. Baptism to me is a big thing because this is a way to prove to myself and prove to him that, okay, God, here's my life. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do with it. I am ready to follow you praise you and love you as much as you love me. My name is Bintam Gisha and today I declare that Jesus is Lord. And praise God for Binta, huh? Praise God for Binta and her decision to declare Jesus as Lord. And I, I just met another gentleman. I just met a gentleman named Peter who's going to get baptized uh, right now. He's going to get baptized right now. So we'll let Graham baptize him. Amen.
Amen. Praise God. Hey, if you would. If you're comfortable, just stretch your hand out towards Peter. Let me just pray for Peter. Father, we thank you so much for his decision. We thank you for Binta's decision, Lord. We just pray that you fill them with your spirit, that they overwhelm with joy, overwhelm with, with just the hope of your gospel. And Father, would you just blow wind on their lives, that they see themselves sent to just be witnesses of what you're doing in their lives. And Father, would you mark this day as the day that they bent their knee, that they surrendered their lives, and that they took up their cross to follow you, Jesus, because this is abundant life. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, look, if today, if today you want to follow Jesus and you want to commit your life to him and want to be baptized, we'll meet you at that black curtain on that side of the auditorium. Otherwise, church, uh, connect with us at the hub if you want any more information on groups, classes, serve teams, all things church. Otherwise, have a great, great week. You are sent to live on mission in the marketplace this week, and we'll see you next weekend.